Hello, everyone. This is Matt Britton, and I want to thank everyone for joining us for today's latest edition of Suzy's State of the Consumer webinar. Uh, we have been doing these webinars uh, now, I guess, over two years since March of 2020, right, the onset of this pandemic. It's been a tremendous channel for us to engage with our customers and our partners and our community at large using the power of Suzy's real-time insights tool to uncover new insights, new ideas, new thoughts on the ever-changing U.S. consumer. And today we have a topic that is always very much at the, at the top of many people's minds, which is sustainability and how sustainable actions speak louder than words. And we have some amazing guests today, and I'm really just excited to dive in. Um, so for those of you who don't know what Suzy is, Suzy is an end-to-end -end consumer insights platform. We put the pulse of the consumer um, at the fingertips of customers across many major categories, allowing them to essentially go direct to consumer with their market research to test any idea, concept, or thought instantly and get valuable, high-quality feedback back to enable consumer-centric decision-making. Um, and we did use Suzy's market research platform for a lot of the research we conducted for today's webinar, uh, which we will discuss. Uh, I am Matt Britton. I'm the founder and CEO of Suzy, um, and also just an avid fan of consumer insights and really have a lot of passion for keeping track of all the changes that are going on. Uh, this pandemic has been fascinating for me obviously also very much disheartening at the same time. Uh, but what it has done is created um, unprecedented change that you know companies in essentially every major sector are dealing with. Uh, and it's really been an honor to walk so many of you through these changes um, as we've uncovered them um, on a weekly basis through our State of Consumer webinar. Um, today, we have three amazing guests coming up um, who all have their own unique take on the state of sustainability within the consumer. We have Holly uh, Cagliano, who is a postdoctoral researcher at Princeton University, Nikki Kashtaler, who's a sustainability manager at Apartis, and on Arshbir Guman, who's a director of Value Channel at Mars Wrigley. So we will be bringing these three esteemed guests in a little bit later to discuss some of the topics that I will be reviewing shortly. Um, we did conduct a study, as I mentioned earlier, to fuel some of the insights we will be discussing today. That study was conducted on the Suzy platform on March 15th, 2022, with a sample size of 1,000 American consumers. The sample for the study is census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So with that, let's dive in. The 2020s are being described, obviously, as a new era of sustainability. Uh, you have a mixture of new innovations happening in the realm of sustainability, like um, electric vehicles. You have the proliferation of social media that have given people on both sides of the sustainability um, and global warming argument um, a microphone that we have never seen before in history. Um, and we have all these new trends going on um, in categories like food, um, you know, with, with plant-based foods um, and cellular-based foods and all these things that are really pushing uh, the envelope in that area. So we've never quite seen so much innovation. We've never set, quite seen so much controversy. Um, and there's a whole lot of passion, especially um, with the millennials entering the C-suite and Gen Z having a louder and louder voice. Um, it's really a fascinating time to dive into the topic of sustainability. We are also at the same time in an era of fake news, um, you know, with the rise of social media, with a, a lot of divisiveness that's happening, um, you know, in the political and geopolitical landscape, so, um, you know, so the topic of sustainability has become quite polarized, quite politicized, not unlike COVID itself. Um, to me, this is very unfortunate because this is something ideally all, all consumers, all global citizens should really be on the same side of creating a better, healthier planet for generations ahead. But it's not always that simple. And people get different sources of information from different places. And in a lot of ways, they are emboldened their, in their beliefs, whether it really is true or not. And this adds a whole, uh, you know, wrench and curveball to kind of the process of pursuing, uh, you know, mandates and pursuing policies, both from a governmental um, and a local perspective to really bring the change of behavior needed to really make the earth a healthier place. Um, and this is something that I'm sure we'll be talking about more today. Uh, the combination of the two is definitely confusing. It's confusing consumers and, you know, by no small means, it's putting the planet at risk. Um, disinformation, many believe, is the most pressing global sustainability issue. Um, and that very, one that you would think is very much in our control, uh, but something that many of us have to grapple with nonetheless. 
Uh, in this webinar, I'm going to be going through a study before we bring our guests on and really debunking the myths and calling out the truths on three major areas. First of all, the area of consumers and sustainability. What are their beliefs and attitudes um, and behaviors towards sustainability? Um, and how are they getting their information and how is that impacting their actions? Second is brands and sustainability. How are large scale consumer brands um, taking the lead? from consumers, taking the lead from scientists and, and embracing the notion of sustainability in their business practices. Um, and what are the myths within that? And lastly, what do consumers want from brands uh, to enable them to embrace sustainability for those who actually want to? Um, those are really the three areas I'm going to be talking about today. And again, we'll be opening up for discussion. So let's talk about consumers first. One of my favorite topics. Uh, myth number one is consumers say they want to be sustainable, but don't back it up. This, this is a myth that many have discussed. Um, I've been so many meetings before where people who sell products say, yes, consumers actually want sustainability, but ultimately they're going to buy the cheapest product. Now, on one hand, I think in this era of rising inflation, as products get more and more expensive, there are many households across America that actually really cannot make that choice. Um, you know, if you have to bring home um, toilet paper or milk um, or, or, you know, any everyday essential to your household, just affording those items and sometimes could be a struggle, let alone having the luxury to choose, is this the most sustainable option? But for the most part, the consumers that we have um, surveyed and communicated with say sustainability is important. And it's not so much that they don't want to back it up with their actions, but in many instances, they actually don't know how. Um, in fact, 92% of consumers say that they want to live a sustainable life, that they say the notion of protecting the future of this planet is very much important. But the question is, are they backing up with actions? Many aren't changing their behavior because they think that they already behave sustainably. So the question of living a sustainable life is one that is very hard to answer because it's not really a binary solution of yes or no. Um, there's a lot of gray area there. And many consumers believe and are emboldened in the fact that the way they live is, in fact, sustainable. One in five say they actually don't need to try to live more sustainably because they already do enough. They think that, that their, their lifestyle and their actions really befit a sustainable lifestyle. Um, consumers think they're above average when it comes to sustainability, more so than not. We, I read a stat that 94% of consumers think that they're above average driver. Uh, we all know that it's not the case and it can't be the case. So I think the fact that many consumers don't know what good is and they think they are doing good uh, in many instances mean that they don't really seek out more education on the topic. The top two ways consumers act sustainably are recycling and donating old items. Those are the ways that they know that they can act um, to, to be uh, more sustainable in their lifestyle. 62% of the consumers we spoke to incorporate sustainability uh, through recycling and a little bit over half incorporate by donating old items. Um, and both actions, unfortunately, might not all they're cracked up to be. Um, you know, the recycling industry in America um, is broken. Um, over 10% of the plastic put in the recycling bins um, have been recycled, and less sadly haven't. Um, there isn't essentially a uniform, um, you know, platform for recycling um, and uniform standards for recycling. And this is one of the areas where consumers believe if they're putting what they believe is the right trash in the recycling bin versus the wrong trash that they're doing their part. But in many instances, um, this isn't enough and they have a false sense of security in thinking that it is enough. Um, and even uh, the donation of clothes, um, an overwhelming 84% of, of donated clothes still end up in landfills and incinerators. So the notion of sustainability in apparel um, is something that I think has a lot of promise. You look at uh, you know more modern platforms like Rent the Runway, which focus on consumers renting clothing uh, versus buying it. I think that's a wonderful step in the right direction in terms of the fact that most consumers only wear a lot of their clothing a couple of times and then it just sits there over time while more people are consuming more new apparel. And I think you know that could be in the solution. But the notion of just donating clothes itself often unfortunately doesn't have the impact that many consumers think it does. And again, a lot of this isn't the consumer's fault. Um, as long as they're concerned, they are doing the right thing. Um, so the real truth behind this is consumers say they act sustainably because they feel they do. But a lot of times the misinformation um, and then being misguided makes their actions less potent and actually solving the problem. Uh, so brands really have an opportunity here to fill the knowledge gap. And education is a huge part of it. Um, there are a lot of parallels between this and COVID, right? And, um, you know, on the notion of COVID, I said the same thing, that brands in many instances are more trusted entities 
than the government and local municipalities. Uh, so many brands have a platform where they can actually educate consumers um, and not only just um, act by telling, but act by showing in terms of how they change their own business practices. So I definitely think it continues to be a huge opportunity for brands to put sustainability as a core brand equity pillar in terms of how they communicate with their audiences. So let's talk a little bit more about brands. Um, second myth is the more brand talks about sustainability, the more sustainable it is. This is interesting because many brands right now have the ability to tell any story they want to on social media platforms. And, you know, in very few instances are the layers of the onion of that brand peeled back to expose the brand. If, the, you know, their actions really are befitting of what they say their actions are uh, in an area like sustainability. Um, Intel was named the most sustainable company of 2022. But if you ask many consumers who the most sustainable companies were, many wouldn't mention Intel. Um, and Intel actually doesn't um, do so much in terms of promoting this. Um, however, they're a company that really embraces it within their business practices. 0.2% um, of consumers only said Intel came to mind when thinking of sustainable brands. So there you have it. You have the most sustainable brand um, in the world. And, you know, it comes in very low ranked in terms of consumers' perception of sustainable brands. Um, you know, should Intel talk more about sustainability? I think a, a brand like Intel has a lot of, um, you know, I would think communication challenges in doing so because Intel is almost like a brand within a brand, so to speak. And a lot of consumers, mainstream consumers, might not even know what Intel actually does. Um, some brands um, are taking a stand against those getting all, cre uh, you know, the credit based solely on their communications and, and this new term called greenwashing. Um, and greenwashing is basically companies overselling their environmental gains, um, you know, really trying to use buzzwords within the area of sustainability to bolster their brand equity, when in reality, their actions behind those words are really quite hollow. Um, as a result, we're seeing brands like Patagonia, a brand that uh, rightfully so, is very well known within the area of sustainability, um, dropping the word sustainability um, in their communications. Uh, they've dropped all use of the word sustainability um, in recognition of the fact that they're a for-profit enterprise. Um, so they're really trying to be honest with themselves and really trying to take a stance against overused uh, what's called eco buzzwords um, and really pushing brands to be more honest. And I think, you know, good for them in doing it. And listen, we've seen this across the board. We've seen this a lot, um, unfortunately, in cancer, uh, pink washing, where you had a lot of female focused brands, um, you know, doing promotional activity um, around breast cancer awareness month. But the reality is, they weren't as philanthropic as you'd think. So anytime there's a cause that it has a mainstream consumer interest and awareness, you are going to find uh, brands, whether it's intentional or not, trying to commercialize these movements for their own business gain. And it's good that you see companies like Patagonia kind of calling them out. And obviously, they're a type of company that has, you know, the right, I think, to stand on a platform and call others out. Um, so sustainability comms are still important, though, uh, because while greenwashing isn't necessarily a great thing, companies also shouldn't have what's called green blushing, which is, you know, being a little bit too uh, humble about their actions, because I think they can set an example for others in terms of the methods they're employing to really set the path for what brands should do. So really the truth is that brands that talk to talk and make it easier to understand how they're doing it are more likely to resonate, but not all brands that are talking about being sustainable are actually sustainable. And, you know, I think it's not just about telling it's about showing. And I think brands can strike the balance between education and, and actually putting the, their business practices, um, you know, where their money, where their mouth is, so to speak, so they can actually make an impact, but also help consumers and educate them to make an impact. And lastly, we're going to talk about the relationship between consumers and brands in relation to this. Um, the first myth, you know, is that consumers will only buy from sustainable brands. Um, we're increasingly being told that sustainability is a mandate for every successful business, but that's just simply not true. I mean, in America, we have a culture of consumption. Um, and we're actually seeing this play out right now on a macroeconomic standpoint right now, um, where supply chain issues have hit America in so many categories. And instead of consumers looking for alternative ways to actually source those products, the demand has continued driving up prices. You know, and, and that's really happened across the board. So many consumers will continue to pay for products um, at retail and not go to eBay and try to buy them used. Um, and as a result, they are not only hurting the environment, but they're, holding, they're hurting their wallets. And it's just been shocking to me that 
despite the fact that there's so much economic pressure that's starting to mount on consumers with the rising uh, cost of borrowing money, rising cost of mortgages, rising cost of almost every product, that consumers have not taken a movement to kind of um, search for other ways to source products, which not only, again, would save the money, but it's far more sustainable. Um, you know, this culture of consumption in America has America's em uh, consumers emboldened in their habits, really at their own peril and at the peril um, of the environment. And if you look at sort of Amazon, you know, it's, it's a perfect, you know, chart here when you look at how well Amazon is done and Amazon is really the, the engine of consumption in America. Now, Amazon has saved a lot of consumers money and Amazon has, has been a huge creator of jobs, but it's also an arbiter of consumption um, in America. I've done a lot of traveling around the world and just the way that consumers buy things and consume things um, and create uh, garbage um, and, and, you know, leave the lights on all those things. I mean, think about hotel rooms in, in most areas around the world. When you go to a hotel room, you have to put your key card in to turn the power on. And then when you take your key card out, the power turns off. Yet in most hotel rooms in America, people just leave the hotel lights on all day, even when they're gone because they're not paying the bill. Right. And that's really, I think, emblematic of the attitudes here and how it's both incumbent on the consumer and the businesses to help make change. Um, both consumers and brands think it's possible and necessary to act sustainably. 57% of both brands think it's um, possible to act sustainably and 57% and, and consumers think it's necessary for brands to act sustainably. So, you know, I think everyone agrees that it's important. But again, is the change really happening uh, is, is really the, the main uh, question here. Um, consumers do care more about brands and sustainability, but a lot of the times it's about them being honest. I think what consumers want from brands is candor and openness and honesty, especially in this world of misinformation where consumers don't know what to believe. Uh, they're in need of honesty because one, they want to figure out who they're dealing with and how, what companies really believe. And two, again, it will help them become educated on this topic where there seems to be so much confusion on. Um, nearly 60% of consumers think brands are talking about sustainability to appeal to consumers. So you're not really, if you're doing this, if you, if you are greenwashing, you're not fooling many consumers where well over half actually understand that you're doing it. And over half also know that it's being talked about because it's good PR. Um, and plenty of brands are really guilty. Uh, this is an example of H&M naming, um, you know, a global sustainability ambassador who's an influencer who really doesn't have too much personal action in her history of supporting sustainability. And it's just sort of like part of an overall campaign. Um, so, you know, I don't know too much about this, but I know that many brands um, will, you know, try to gravitate towards something where they see Gen Z is interested and millennials are interested. Again, let's throw it in our overall messaging but it's often not that simple uh, to actually pull off. So what consumers want to see is tan tangible change that will genuinely help the planet. Um, now, whether or not that can happen for, you know, in a short period of time, I think remains to be seen. And um, there's much smarter people on the topic that are about to join us uh, that will obviously opine on the topic. Uh, so, you know, the last truth is brands don't need to be totally sustainable, but they do, do need to be honest. Um, so I'm really excited um, to stop talking and start um, asking um, our amazing guests. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, I'd love our, for our three uh, uh, esteemed guests to jump on and we can get into a, a discussion here. Great. That was fast and awesome. Okay. We have everyone. Perfect. Um, so I want to welcome all of you. Uh, for joining. And, you know, obviously, I've been really excited just to hear um, everyone's thoughts on the matter. So first, let's just do a quick introduction. Holly, starting with you, would love to hear about uh, your background uh, and some of the work that you've done in, in the sustainability area. Great. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, great you, presentation Holly. and happy Thank to you. be here. Uh, I'm Holly. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Princeton's Anlinger Center for Energy and the Environment. Um, probably Broadly, I uh, study the social dimensions of sustainability transformations. Um, how do we get to where we want to be at, through these kind of socio-political structures? So I'm really looking forward to talking more about all of this. Likewise. Um, Arshbeer, uh, please tell us about yourself. Absolutely. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. I am Arshbeer or Arsh Guman. I am currently with Mars Wrigley. So, you know, wonderful skills and M&Ms and Snickers as the director of the value channel, which includes Dollar Tree um, and all of the other value players. Uh, previously, I was the global brand manager for our pet. So our Caesar products, I always bring something for show and tell. Um, and I've spent 
a bigger part of that as the global brand manager, trying to figure out how do we make um, some of our brands more sustainable and what does sustainability actually mean to the pet parent? Um, and I'm excited to be here. Likewise. Uh, Nikki. Thanks, Matt. And thank you for having me. Of course. Um, Nikki Cashdollar. I'm our sustainability manager at App Harvest. Um, App Harvest, if you haven't heard of it, is a sustainable food company uh, located in Appalachia. And we are growing in some of the largest um, high-tech indoor farms in the U.S. Some call-outs on the sustainability of growing this way. We're using 90% less water. We can achieve 30 times yield. And what we're growing is the produce that you see on your grocery store shelves. So we have one facility open already that's 60 acres in Moorhead, Kentucky. I'm based in Lexington and we have three more on the way. And I consider myself an environmentalist and a consumer. So I'm really excited to jump in on some of the questions. Great. So let's just dive right in. Uh, something that came up in our research was the notion of, of green blushing, uh, mm -hmm. which is companies maybe not uh, but holding back a little bit in terms of talking about their, you know, sustainability practices on the same front, this notion of, of greenwashing where companies are doing the exact opposite. They're kind of overselling their business practices. Um, I guess I'll start with you, Arsh, and, you know, running a, such a large scale of consumer brands. How do you guys strike that balance? Yeah, it's a good one. Um, I actually hadn't heard the term green blushing Me either. Um, until this presentation. So um, I'm not surprised that brands are shying away from speaking because I think brands have this misguided notion sometimes that you really need to have a, a high and impressive impact in order to actually drive change. But I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think for coming from a Mars pet care perspective, you've probably seen many of our brands in the news over the past couple of years as we've started to make this journey of identifying what is this sustainability transformation that needs to happen. Right. We've been through a digital transformation of sorts and everyone's yeah. familiar with that. But the sustainability transformation is a lot harder because you need to balance, you know, what did what does your brand actually stand for? Right. Are you an activist like Sheba Hope? Right. Sheba is a pet, is a cat brand, and cats love fish, right? So, and fish are dying because our coral reefs are dying. So Sheba has been playing a massive role in restoring the coral reefs. Right? So that is a very activist position. Sure. But you could also be an advocate, which you're not really at the level of an activist, but you're at the very least, either from a plastic or recyclability standpoint or ingredient standpoint, making a small enough difference. So I think there's a wide range of roles that brands can play, but you really need to understand and, and look at your brand strategy to figure out what is that role? And that's really question number one. Yeah. And when you talk about digital transformation, in some ways that could be skin deep in terms of how you communicate. When you talk about transformation into a sustainable organization, it could go as deep into, into the ingredients in your product and how it's made and how it's packaged and shipped. And it's a long journey uh, and, and one that really impacts every aspect of the organization. Um, and perhaps that's why a lot of you, you see a lot of this greenwashing, because the notion of truly being able to walk the walk, you know, in a way that you might not get called out on um, is a long journey and it's not going to happen overnight. And we don't live in a world where there's a lot of patience. Absolutely. Um, so, Nikki, I'd love to hear about your business because your business was started at Parvis is a relatively new business, right? It, when was it founded? That's right. We've been around for um, about three years, but our facility right. has only been operational for just over a year. So. Right. So, and Mars Wrigley has been around, what, a hundred years? I mean, they're it's a merger of two companies, mm -hmm. but right, yeah. probably a, about a century. So, yeah. um, so there you go. So you have a company that has, let, let, you know, iconic brands, more legacy systems, much harder to, to enact change. You know, they're more of a cargo ship where when you're starting mm -hmm. three years ago, you're more of a speedboat, right? And you can turn quicker and you're also mm -hmm. starting with a much more modern infrastructure based upon when the business was formed. So I would imagine that gives a company like App, Hardis, App, App, App Harvest distinct advantages in terms of truly embracing this practice. So I'd love to hear in terms of, you, you mentioned some of the things during your intro in terms of what is the business model and what makes it so very differentiated in this, in this way. Yeah, I think one of the major advantages to App Harvest is having the sustainability mindset at the core of the company. So we were trying to figure out a way to use business as a force for good. Um, and that's that centralization of that commitment makes a lot of the decisions and priorities easier for us. Sure. Arsh, what we were just talking about, I think 
when I am going to make a sustainability claim or a marketing department is going to make a sustainability claim um, and we put something out on social media, we're going to get a million comments, not even necessarily from uh, people that would be you know, labeled as non-believers or haters or anything. They're just genuinely curious consumers right. and want to know the information that backs up all the things that you're committing to in terms of your sustainability. So for us, that means we have to have all those bases covered to be able to answer all those questions. So one of the first things that we did is we put out an annual sustainability report. Even if we didn't have that much business progress to report on, we wanted to start establishing a baseline. So if consumers are interested in the granular level of what our policies look like, what our diversity of the company looks like, how many natural resources we're using to produce our product, they can go and get access to that information. And then I'll probably repeat this a couple of times, but third party certification right now seems to be one of the ways that you can really verify all of the claims that you're making and also kind of use that for goal setting. So if you don't exactly know where to get started, you can look to third parties and other organizations. Holly, I see you nodding your head. I'm sure you can really go in on that. But that's been one way for us to kind of help get our feet grounded in how we want to move the company um, while keeping that sustainability um, central to our business. Yeah. And, and Holly, I'm, I'm glad you, you called her out, Nikki. I mean, uh, one thing that I just had a question on is when you talk about third party certification and you look at things like carbon offsets, right? To me, that seems like an area that just ri could be rife for misconstruing what it really is because you know are really is the same company claiming that they plant it the same tree to, you know 20 times over like is it really a carbon offset so i guess you know what does this solve for all of this when you have a business like app harvest that's doing the right things that's validating its third-party certification is that the solution to really get the validation that they need that they're doing the right things these are all amazing points um i think Speaking to carbon offsets, you're exactly right. They're not all created equal. Yeah. Um, even just anecdotally, internally, uh, I did my PhD at Rutgers and we were mm -hmm. working on our climate task force of uh, how do we get just the university to net zero uh, and had a huge kind of internal debate about carbon offsets. Um, mm -hmm. And just the, you know, for a bunch of professors who do this for a living to try to wade through the mud um, of which carbon offsets are legitimate and which carbon offsets are kind of acceptable to the student body and are seen as legitimate um, is very, very challenging. So I think that's ripe for disruption and, you know, creating that kind of uh, communication uh, around these tactics to elucidate more clearly for consumers to better understand. Um, and as far as kind of, I, one thing that third party certifications made me think of was carbon labels and kind of the research coming out around that. Uh, there's a new paper that reviewed all of this research on carbon labels. And because people are kind of always wondering, does it shift uh, consumer purchase habits? Um, you know, are carbon labels moving the needle? Uh, and the answer is mixed, um, kind of sometimes maybe, I don't know, but what the researchers are saying uh, is that overall, if it's pushing the industry forward uh, and, you know, in specific industries and in, in the food industry um, and, you know, uh, forcing that accounting of carbon emissions, uh, then overall it's a net benefit. Right. And, and, and just as a cons putting your consumer hat on, given the knowledge you have in this space, you know, when you're, you know, on Facebook or you're reading or, and you're, you're reading an article about a company's, um, I guess, practices in this area, you know, what are you looking for to feel good about a company's business practice just from an outside standpoint, outside of just certification, just from reading between the lines? Yeah, I think data, um, having the data publicly available, making it clear, making it understandable for consumers, I think, um, in when I was teaching, uh, a particularly good example is Levi. Um, yep. I think in terms of their communication around sustainability initiatives and backing it up with data and in kind of a comprehensive way, not kind of over highlighting one area, um, but being pretty clear. And I think they're also pretty clear about their um, where they can do better. Yeah, I think a big driver, and I'd love to open up to everyone here just in the sustainability area is our economy in America and really around the world is about to take a major shift and kind of the writing on the wall. Um, a lot of this is the result, almost like the hangover of the pandemic, the pandemic hit, um, you know, the government pumped trillions and trillions of dollars of capital 
into the system, um, into a culture and society in America and in many other civilized Western nations where consumption was just through the roof. Um, and that consumption was really driven by globalization. You know, you had cheap labor um, and, and cheaper products that allowed consumers to buy things that, you know, our parents would never be able to buy with such frequency. And then you had Amazon and all of a sudden everyone's getting a million packages every day. Things are piling up and we entered this crazy area of consumption. And then the pandemic hit and all of a sudden we realized how much our, you know, our society relies on globalization, relies on China, relies on cheap labor. Um, and now, you know, a mixture of obviously a lot of, um, you know, geopolitical issues that we're seeing, obviously right now in, in Russia and the Ukraine um, and just the pandemic and relations with China. And all of a sudden, A, products are not going to be as easy to get. B, they're going to be a lot more expensive. The cost of capital, and like credit card debt, is going to be a lot more. And in a lot of ways, I'm thinking this could push consumers towards less consumption, which ultimately is more sustainable uh, versus they really had no reason to act that way unless they wanted to, where now there might be a forcing function. So, you know, Arsh, when you talk about the value channel, I, you know, I, it, it strikes me as like, okay, well, at the same token, you're working on channels where many, may, many consumers might flock to, right? Because when things become more expensive at a Target, maybe they will go to a Costco or, you know, a, a value store or a dollar store, et cetera. So how do you think this all plays together in terms of the macroeconomic situation and then you focusing on more value channel? It's, it's a, a great lot. question. I, I think that's how my mind works. I'm it's, just it's, trying to synthesize all these things. <laughs> No, no, I mean, I'm fully tracking, right? On the one hand, it's, it's the ever-present tension of, um, you know, of affordability and eco-consciousness. Yeah. And that tension existed before inflation and before everything was happening, right? So, and with this inflationary pressures that we have, that tension isn't going away. I think what it's doing, both to brands and retailers, is start to question what the true value proposition of the brands are. Yeah. Right? And it's a good opportunity to continue to figure out what that value proposition is, right? As a brand steward, for me, I need to look at it in a dynamic way, right? Otherwise, in a couple of years, if I don't start planning now, if the consumer has moved towards finally a non-wishy-washy stance on sustainability, I'm kind of screwed. Right. So I need to continuously update that. Now, yeah. there are a few ways that can play out. Ingredients and your carbon footprint, right, is like one main bucket. And that the global supply chain crisis is really putting a damper on, right? Because if you think about the scale that Mars Wrigley has, Mars Pet Care has, and if I want to change from, you know, whatever one of the ingredients on the Caesar, which is I'm going to pick pork byproducts, right? Or I'm going to pick beef. Let's just pick beef, right? Beef has a higher carbon footprint. And if I say, now I'm going to start sourcing chicken, which has a lower carbon footprint, there may not be enough supply of chicken to actually make that switch. Right. Or M&M's has been moving away from, um, it's moving towards natural coloring. But if I take all of that supply of natural coloring, then it's just one brand benefiting versus, you know, the entirety of the planet. And there are trade-offs that need to be made there, right? So from an ingredient standpoint, I mean, to answer your question on inflationary pressures, there's only so much that a brand can do because at the end of the day, the affordability has to come into play. And that is where I think going back to what I originally said, sustainability needs to be part of your brand strategy, but it cannot be your only brand strategy. The rest yeah. of your brand house needs to be in order. Your distinctiveness, right, which comes from what your brand stands for, from your colors, from your logo, um, and that mental availability that you're driving still needs to be in, in order. It doesn't necessarily have to be first, it can be shared but it still needs to be something that you consider. Yeah. And at the same time, you have stakeholders that, you know, want to drive business growth and want revenue growth and want profitability. So, you know, we don't just live in an idealistic world. You know, you guys have to keep people employed and, you know, deliver for your shareholders. So it's, it's, a, it's a big balancing act for sure. It is. It is. And it's, and it's more expensive. So, I mean, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. We've seen, you know, the elasticity of a lot of brands during the past couple of months, right? Yep. And, and that for me makes me a bit hopeful that we can start having more of the sustainability conversations as a way right. to say, we previously thought 
that these brands were inelastic, but that's not proving to be true. Right. So what else can we do yeah. now that that assumption has kind of gone out the water? Yeah. And, you know, and, and one reason why I think is that consumers had record high savings coming into this period. The Absolutely. question is, will they last forever? You know, when they when they have to pay more for their mortgage, when they have to pay more for gasoline or bread, et cetera, you know, th does that start to change? And I guess, you know, that remains to be seen. Um, and we'll see. Um, so, and so Nikki, your business, it looks like you focus more on kind of like a higher um, income consumer. Is that, is that true? Just in terms of the products and the positioning? We do sell product in when the target consumer fits what you just said, Matt, but we also are very comparable to a traditional tomato that you'll find on the grocery Interesting. shelf. Interesting. Okay. So uh, the cost comparison, um, what's really beneficial to us is that we're producing at scale. So right. it's the 60 acre size um, and efficient distribution that's able to keep the cost competitive. But I mean, to what Arsh was saying, I had a couple other thoughts on brands really? just that I see as a consumer um, jumping in on trying to be a part of the sustainability movement. And if they don't know if their brand is elastic or inelastic, trying to pass the responsibility on to the consumers, but still get some type of um credit for that. I'm thinking specifically of airlines. Now, when you choose yeah. a flight, you can say, I want to go with this option. And you're educated on the fact that you maybe are saving carbon emissions, this one versus this one. I'm also thinking about shipment. You can pay more to have your material shipped to you in a more efficient way, equating to carbon savings, or maybe you can wait longer for your package to arrive to equate right. to more carbon savings. So you can see that brands are becoming very um, strategic about it. One thing that I love that App Harvest does is we've kind of shied away from the broad sustainability claim, and we're really giving consumers the details behind why our product is better and better for the environment. So instead of um, saying our product is socially responsibly made, we say we pay 100% living wage. And that's the language that we use so that consumers know exactly what we mean behind all those claims. Great. Um, I'd love to kind of start to move towards the future and where it's a little headed in terms of mm -hmm. what's on the horizon for sustainable practices. So let's start with you, Holly, in terms of in the next couple of years, what do you think some of the big hot topics are going to be around this area? Well, I have kind of two parts to this answer. And the first is uh, jumping off Nikki. I think App Harvest does a fantastic job kind of putting together the ESNG. Um, mm -hmm. They're recognizing that these aren't separate issues. Um, uh, sustainability, labor practices, equity, these are really many times you're addressing uh, the same issues sure. uh, together uh, in this kind of holistic perspectives. Uh, and I think that's important to consumers. Um, so, you know, kind of the integration of all of these factors and not looking at them as, okay, well, we checked the sustainability box. Um, how do we, you know, move down the line and, and check the fair labor standards box? Um, how do we do this together in a way that makes sense um, and, you know, pays people a living wage and treats them well? Um, and then the second thing, uh, electrification. Um, majorly, I mean, you know, in kind of every aspect of our lives, uh, I don't know if anybody has seen uh, Bill McKibben's heat pumps for peace. Um, kind of, you know, a lot of the conversation is like, how do we make heat pump sexy? Uh, you know, it's kind of a, whoever picked that term, it's kind of doesn't really clearly articulate what a heat pump is. Uh, and that's for anybody who doesn't know, a transition away from heating your home with natural gas um, and electrifying it. But a heat pump can uh, both heat and cool your home. So heat pump. But uh, yeah, heat pumps, EVs, uh, you know, moving, pulling that natural gas plug. Yep. And I think one, one of the main issues when it comes to electric vehicles is ultimately you still have to make the batteries where the electricity is stored, which means, you know, cobalt, lithium, whatever the raw materials are. And the question is, well, where do you mine those? And that has environmental issues attached to it as well. So I think one misconception is it's sort of a binary thing, but any decision that you make, um, especially when it comes to the production of batteries, still creates a whole nother secondary area of challenges in order of delivering upon that. So, um, yeah. but, but, but ultimately, yes, energy independence and we're seeing it play out right now is incredibly important, not only for the environment, but I think for national security. So I think there's a lot behind it for sure. I agree with that for sure. Uh, and that, that framing of it, right. As that these are, this is attacking two uh, issues that are really the same thing. Uh, yep. there's both energy security, um, uh, and environmental sustainability. 
Absolutely. Um, Arsh, anything that you have that in terms of some future practices and things that maybe your company is looking at moving forward? Yeah, I think in the short term, it's in the short term, the onus is going to be on the manufacturers and the brands. Sure. Right. And because I think we're still very much in this benefits for me, benefits for me as a consumer mindset of sustainability, right? Is it natural? Is it organic? Is it is there transparency in how it's produced? Um, I think we're starting to see this benefits for them, right? Fair trade, um, animal welfare, farmers welfare. But I think in the mid to long term, there's going to be a reckoning for benefits for we, right? We as one planet how do we start to come together and really start impacting the ecosystem, right? It's not enough that this bag that I have is recyclable. It now has to connect and actually has to be recyclable where right. the recycling association or whatever their official title is, um, is accepting it. And I think that reckoning is coming as more and more consumers and Gen Zers start to come into purchasing power. Absolutely. And it's super relevant for them. So I think that reckoning is coming, but in the short term, it's it's on us yep. on, as manufacturers to figure that out. And in the long term, I think I don't want to say we'll be rewarded, but I think in the long term, the, the conversation will start to move and shift. And and we really need to be prepared for that. Absolutely. Nikki, uh, lastly, in terms of App Harvest, who obviously again has the ability to continue to innovate at speeds that larger companies can't. What are some of the things you're looking at as the business model continues to evolve? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, one of the most important things for us is in the very beginning, setting up a materiality assessment, which is essentially just trying to identify areas that I think are most important to start gathering data on so we can establish a baseline. What are um, our vendors, maybe like a, a Kroger or Wendy's, something like that, what they value, what our investors value, consumers value, and put all those opinions together and to determine what our material topics are. And that really helps us narrow in our focus yep. on what the next couple of years should look like. So we're not just guessing. And of course, I'm coming at this from a little bit more of a sustainability perspective. But if I could give brands advice, it'd be you have to start somewhere. And sometimes that somewhere is just gathering information about where you are already. Absolutely. So maybe look at what your carbon footprint already is. What are you using within your current business practices? And if you're looking to differentiate yourselves by making a claim um, about continuous improvement, then establish that baseline and figure out where you can go from there. Where can you uh, be responsible and make improvements and then pass those um, things on to your customers? It's great advice and something that I think a lot of brands can listen to for sure. Um, I'd love to call on my uh, colleague, Abel Flint, um, who has some questions from the audience that uh, we'll dive into. So Abel, thanks for joining us. Great to see you. Thanks. Good to see you too, Matt. Um, tons of really interesting questions. Obviously, this is a topic that lots of people care about. Um, so I'm just going to kind of ask and feel free to jump in. But I think the first question, I think, Matt, you alluded to, a little bit to this earlier about hotels and in other countries kind of using cards and turning off lights. But um, for those of you who have knowledge, how did the, some of these findings kind of extend globally? What are you guys seeing outside of the U.S. market? Um, so I don't know if, Holly, you have some interesting kind of perspective of that from the academia world. My work is primarily based in the U.S., um, but I think that there are kind of a lot of cultural differences and, um, you know, kind of lifestyle considerations that we have to think about, um, specifically considering uh, some European countries, um, things that are just norms there that are kind of starting to shift over to America. Uh, and I think of, you know, things like the reusable bag. Um, I think, you know, Denmark was on 20 years ago. Um, and, and you have this kind of social situation in which your, you know, your thrift store finds are, you know, cooler and what you have been able to reuse and your family heirlooms um, rather than the best newest thing that you can buy. Um, so culturally exporting some of that here, I think, would be a good thing. Um, but, you know, there's a long way to go. Definitely. Um, Nikki, Arsh, do you guys have any thoughts on that of what you might be seeing? I think from a, um, not from a hotel, et cetera, perspective, but from an ingredient use perspective, right? The U.S., especially in pet care, um, is widely different than Europe, right? Where Europeans, um, you know, if you think about using the whole animal, like offal is not so off-putting, right? And if you put that 
in in a pet product it it actually is um is is not a novelty but it's something that's expected and they wouldn't blink an eye but americans like awful is not something that they would expect out of um out of their pet pro products so i think when you think about using the entire animal and making sure that um that is part of your sustainability um footprint right i think that's where there's a slight difference but Americans are starting to shift and understand um, as we start to communicate some of this a little bit further on different varieties of ingredients. Yeah, and if Abel, I can just add in specific to App Harvest, the globalization that Matt was referring to earlier is something that we've seen consistently within our, our food supply chain. That's one of the benefits that App Harvest is seeing is having a homegrown food supply of fresh fruits and vegetables. If there are issues importing what you would normally consume at the grocery store, um, just looking at what you can do to create that, that local and homegrown food supply. For us, it's a big advantage in cost savings. We get to pass the cost savings of uh, shipment off to our consumers. We're located within 70% of the U.S. population. And so businesses just, I think, are becoming much more strategic about what will benefit their consumers. And you're seeing that within the U.S. and globally as well. Yeah. Um, I think in, even in my own kind of seeing throughout the world, I think there's a lot of places where, you know, they're using more reusable bags. They're um, mm -hmm. doing a lot more practices like that, that only in New York City have they started, you know, banning, um, you know, plastic bags. Um, I think, so my next question for you all is, do you all have some thoughts on the ways that brands, companies, um, maybe even in the nonprofit sector can collaborate more with each other, whether that's in the same category or across industries um, and work in partnership in kind of tackling some of these elements of sustainability? This is kind of the one of the main focuses of my research, um, not just private companies and brands, but coalition building more broadly. Uh, how do we come together to do these things? I think it's about finding those shared goals, um, you know, across the board in terms of sustainability and then meeting somewhere in the middle um, where everybody benefits. Uh, so I think uh, one thing that keeps coming to mind uh, is not only you know how are brands giving good information um but also stepping away from disinformation you know we've seen such a, a trend in climate disinformation um that brands can do a better job appearing uh, more credible uh, when they do band together and are you know kind of giving the same information uh, and are on board together so i think in terms of that um you know kind of climate disinformation landscape working together really benefits everybody and Holly, I'm curious from your perspective, have you seen really good examples of these coalition buildings? Maybe what are some of the things that kind of have made them particularly successful? I'm, I can't think of anything specific in the kind of brand landscape, but mm -hmm. something I've been thinking about a lot lately uh, is the efforts of cities like C40 cities, um, uh, kind of groups of mayors uh, that have come together to reach these goals um, and then are able to kind of create standards that everybody can use. Um, I think a couple weeks ago uh, in my class, I was teaching about life cycle assessment. Uh, you know, as, as a means for collecting this kind of data about products. Uh, and one of the first companies to do that was Coca-Cola, but they didn't share any of it. Um, it was all proprietary um, and it was, you know, for them to cut costs down. And this is, you know, way back 70s, um, you know, before anybody was super worried about climate change. Uh, but being able to kind of share that information and data uh, and specifically methodologies uh, in a way that's mutually beneficial and not just like, OK, you know, we're going to, you know, figure out this amazing way to calculate, um, you know, some kind of carbon accounting, uh, but then not share that. And everybody has to keep reinventing the wheel. I think that's uh, one of the ways that coalitions really come into play. Yeah. Awesome. Arsh, Nikki, do you guys have some thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, so you guys have heard me say a million times the scale that Mars Wrigley has, right? But we're just one company in right. in our search for, for cocoa and good chocolate, right? So um, I think we need to absolutely partner with the likes of our some of our competitors in this space because we can't tackle the sustainability of cocoa farms on our own. We can't tackle deforestation um, on our own, right? And there are coalitions in place and there have been some massive wins, you know, the most recent one coming out of the EU legislation where the coalition of uh, cocoa manufacturers 
came together to drive more transparency in the cocoa industry to say, um, how are we uh, not just capping, but also understanding the import export of cocoa so that we're doing it in a sustainable way. Uh, so I think that's just one example of what Mars Wrigley is doing. The second is on deforestation, which is it's critical to the success, uh, to eliminate deforestation is critical to the success of our environment. And Mars Wrigley and Mars Inc, uh, actually at that level, plays very heavily with many of our partners to ensure that we are being impactful because we recognize that we can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely happening. I think the next big step is how do we start to partner with the recyclers and start to make an impact in, in US legislation. And I'm sure, you know, um, it's not something that I alone can impact again, but it needs it needs to come. And it and that's where we need everyone. And that's where the benefits for we really comes in. Um, and and then there's individual onuses as well, right? So from a branded standpoint, Shiba can try and save the coral reef on its own and, it, and it's doing a tremendous job. But if other brands started to take that and say, oh, cool, now we can do that too. I think that would be a huge win. Uh, we might not necessarily come at it in a joint planning session, um, right? And like Shiba has sat with the National Geographic and the Australian government, et cetera, to plan it. But if other brands want to jump ship and, and say, we love this and we want to join in, I mean, the more the merrier. Um, and it's not something that we necessarily have to work together. We can come at it independently and still be able to restore the coral reef. Definitely. Holly, I'll jump in at the part where you were saying you couldn't think of a brand coalition that came to mind. One that's really beneficial to App Harvest is our B Corp certification. So when we were founded, um, essentially went through an assessment and an audit that verified the different sustainability claims that we were making in the environment, community, um, employees section. And once you're a part of that community, I was really surprised by how open anyone that shared that certification with you was. So, I mean, they'll make coalitions by geographic area, they'll make it by industry. So App Harvest being in the food and Bev industry, I've seen those life cycle assessments shared and it almost gives us like a stepping stone so we can see what's already done and what can we do for continuous improvement. One of the examples that came out of this collaboration is during the thick of COVID. Um, our production is very much in person. We grow tomatoes and it requires our employees to be in person and taking care of them. So we wanted to make sure we had all the PPE and any equipment that they would need. Um, and we turned to fellow B Corps that we knew were also still producing products. Maybe they'd shifted. So for example, we partnered with Chico Bags to make all of our masks for us. They even provided uh, fellow B Corps a discount for partnering with each other. And there was this whole inventory that B Lab, the third party that um, puts together the certifications, had put together just as a resource, knowing that we can lean on each other. So I love to see that um, within controlled environment agriculture, there's becoming more and more coalitions as well. Our founder, Jonathan Webb, usually says there's room for all of us when there's this larger demand for fresh fruits and vegetables that are locally grown. Arsh, kind of like what you were saying, the coral reefs need more than just one company to step up. So it's it's kind of leaning on each other. And the companies that are really open to sharing information, they're the ones I think that are helping accelerate one another. Yeah. It's so I great think... to know about B Corp. Yeah. It's called the beehive, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> um, well, I think these have all been really, really great. Amazing. Um, one final question I have for you all. So, um, you know, joining this webinar, we have people who are on all different various stages of sustainable practices and how they're talking about it. So uh, for maybe some of those brands who have not gotten to a place like Sheba where they're helping to rebuild coral reefs, you know, where can they get started and how should they start thinking about even beginning to have these internal conversations? Um, and I'll call it Holly first. Where should they get started? Um, I think from, you know, I can't speak to it from kind of a business perspective, but I can speak to it from kind of a, where do you think your main value is going to be? Um, you know, investigating, if it's something that's starting from an idea, 
um, you know, how is that, how is that idea contributing in some way to making the world a better place? I mean, I think so many people who go into business pursuits, um, you know, have this conviction, like, I know that I can do something good with this. Um, well, how can you leverage that? Uh, and then how can you build that uh, into your brand, um, into your communications, into your development uh, across the whole chain? And being able to start out that way, um, as we've talked about earlier, you know, is a great benefit um, in terms of being able to start from square one with your communication. Um, yeah, I think, I, but I think Nikki and Arsh will probably have a uh, better kind of business oriented solutions. Yeah. I think you're absolutely on point, Holly. Um, I will start, I mean, I've said this before, but if you're not selling, you're not influencing. So I think the number one thing, any people who are on the branded side, you really need to get your brand house in order, right? So because again, if you're not selling, you're not influencing. And then from there, take stock of what you're already doing across these different dimensions, right? It could be from packaging, it could be from ingredients, it could be from um, you know, some of your other comms partnerships that you have. And then within that, you know, if you come up with an assessment of from an ingredient standpoint, we are contributing X number, um, I don't know what the KPI, but X to carbon footprint. And that's really where we want to focus on that will come out, right? I think there's another way around this, which is there has to be passion from the org as well, right? If you as one brand within the org say that packaging is where you want to influence, but the rest of the org isn't there, you're not going to make much movement on packaging. And if you come up with, um, and that's where I say, look back at everything that you've done, look back where some of the comments your consumers have left for you, your social listening activities. And if a lot of what is positive about you is, you know, the impact that you've had on, on let's say, recyclability, right? Lean into that, right? Because I think it's, it is a virtuous cycle. And if you lean into it, that's where the authenticity comes from. You don't necessarily have to invent something from scratch to focus on. And you may think that, oh, recyclability, it was just a one-off comment or one-off campaign that we ran. But I would say, I, I think it came from somewhere and it came from your brand strategy somewhere and, and run with that. Um, but if you have to invent something from scratch, that's okay too. You need to figure out why you came up with that idea because it's, it's always gonna come, to, come back to the why. Because year one, you might have one impact. Year two, you might have another impact. And you might keep building, but if you don't have that why, it's all going to fall apart in year two, I guarantee it. It's a great point. Yeah. Um, Abel, do you mind if I yeah, give a quick response? Please. Yes. Okay. Um, the one thing that I want to say to brands that don't necessarily have in-house expertise or a good place to start is if you have it in the budget, there are experts out there and it would be totally okay to ask. So if you wanna establish a baseline of data collection or a strategy that will actually be impactful and well-perceived by consumers. I mean, if you're listening to this, the Suzy webinar, you probably have some type of interest in learning more about your consumer insights. So I would say the same thing for um, maybe doing like a carbon footprint analysis to figure out how much of your scope one, two or three emissions. And if you don't know what that means, again, there's like experts out there that can help establish that baseline. Um, so that would be one of my um, suggestions. And then Arsh kind of touching on the internal portion of the like company in general, I think it's so important for everyone at the company to have some type of sustainability mindset or priority. If you work in accounting and you don't touch any type of sustainability strategy, you should still generally understand that that's a commitment for the company. One thing that App Harvest does is in our all hands meeting, we just go through what you can and cannot recycle in our offices. So it's a really small thing, but it gets people thinking every single day about their personal impact um, that the company is contributing. And so if you can do small things like that or send out tips in your newsletter about how you can be more sustainable at home, if you're working at home, things like that, I think are really great places to start. Definitely. Well, that is all the questions here, but thank you, Nikki, Holly, Arsh. I'll hand it back to Matt to kind of yeah. final this, closing. This statement. was great. No, the hour flew by so fast. So much great content. 
Um, I really want to thank Nikki, Howie, and Arch for joining today in your busy schedules. Um, I'm sure our audience got a ton from it. Looking forward to getting the feedback and to doing more of these uh, state of consumer webinars in the future. So on behalf of myself, Abel, and the Susie team, and our great guests, we want to thank everyone for joining. And everyone stay safe, and uh, we'll see you all soon. Take care.